Hey, everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living Live. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest today is one of our very favorites, Dr. Doug Lyle. He's not only the co-author of The Pleasure Trap, but he's the psychologist at both the True North Health Center and the McDougal Living Program, both located in Santa Rosa, California. He has an amazing podcast that he stars every weekend, Wednesday nights at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time called Beat Your Genes. G-E-N-E-S, and you can listen to that live and even ask questions live. You can find it on Blog Talk Radio or iTunes, and there's over a 100 episodes now that you can listen to. And he's got an amazing website, esteemdynamics.com, where you can watch all kinds of great audio and video and even book a private consultation with him. So welcome, Dr. Lyle. We love talking to you. I, or I love talking to you. <laughs> they love listening to you. So we, we've collected some interesting questions over the few months that you've done these monthly broadcasts for us. And sometimes we don't get to all the questions. So I'll get to as many as you're able to ask to answer today. Okay. So this was an interesting one. I thought from Phil, we get mostly we get women watching and writing, but so whenever there's a dude, I always try to get his questions asked. He said, why is there so not so much, but he said, why is there often disagreement among the wonderful plant-based doctors about what seems to be minutia instead of arguing either openly or not openly, shouldn't they be more concentrated on being on the same since my rather than fighting amongst themselves. So he wants to know why that happens. And is there something? You know, the trip about? is there isn't anything to be done about it. Um, what, what this is, is this is human nature. So human nature is, is that uh, knowledge advances as people argue. That's how it works. And so science is driven by the, the egos of people that are trying to prove themselves right and prove their competitors wrong. And so the, the, um, the competitions involved here are at, at different levels. So for example, let's suppose that there was a concerted effort on the part of, I don't know, some, some group of people to try to crush the notion of plant-based nutrition. Then our guys would all gang up together, okay? But because there's not a concerted effort, uh, it, you've heard this story many times and uh, from many different uh, uh, places in your life. So you've heard, you know, the Democrats say, well, we Democrats argue like crazy amongst ourselves, but as soon as we are attacked, then we're a group, okay? Or we Americans fight among ourselves, but once we're attacked, then we're all on the same pitch, okay? This is human nature. So... Within any group, there's a constant squabbling. Uh, that's the nature of, of human beings. There, this is, uh, and I'm not going to say it's just for people's egos. It's because they really believe, or usually, often they really believe what it is that they're saying. So you can imagine um, seven guys on some a long hike, and then there's an argument amongst them, which exactly is the right trail home. They're going to, like, fight about it, okay? The uh, But... But if there's a, another group comes along and says, oh, no, it's that way, it's like, well, no, wait a second. We don't know that you we trust you people. And so this is a, the, the notion of sort of the, the coagulation uh, of a position will take place when there's an outside threat. There's no outside threat to plant-based nutrition. Uh, it's all just some scattered basic background noise of, of the general culture. And so as a result, uh, we are free in this arena to squabble about as this as this questioner asks uh, or says minutia, a lot of times it's not exactly minutia, but it's close, and a lot of it is minutia, and uh, that's how we battle it out and see if there's any flaws in anybody's reasoning uh, or any or any uh, deficits in in their own information base, and that's that's how it's perfectly healthy and perfectly reasonable. Okay. Well, thank you so much. So Amber has a question about body dysmorphia. She wants to know why it's so common in women, even women that are beautiful, fit, and lean. Yeah, I think it's, I think that what you're seeing is uh, the issue of hyperconscientiousness. So this is a personality. I think this is more of a personality issue than anything else. The, um, I think it, it probably, uh, sometimes juxtaposes some other issues. Like, for example, if you have been in any kind of a competitive arena where there has been a lot of scrutiny about your body, model, actress, gymnast, a swimmer, you know, uh, if, you're, if your body has been out there open for inspection and criticism, 
uh, and and your female uh, females uh, uh, women by listen to each. <laughs> <laughs> I talk like a biologist. I, I get up it. The uh, <laughs> women. I'll try to try to get this straight. The uh, w- uh, women are uh, m- a higher percentage of their mate value is in their attractiveness as opposed to men. Uh, it isn't that a lot of men's mate value isn't in their attractiveness. It is okay, but uh, a higher percentage of that of that total attractiveness is in. Uh, is in the female attractiveness and the female physique um, is very important to the male eye because the males are looking to detect pregnancy. And so as a result, uh, even if you're a few pounds overweight, it can, um, it, it can be disturbing to a woman to even deal with a little bit of, of shape that does, isn't perfect. And if you, uh, if you add to this two things, if you add, as I said, any kind of history involving scrutiny. And if you add to that also a very high conscientiousness, which of course, interestingly enough, people that are actresses, models, and gymnasts, and swimmers are gonna to tend to be high conscientious. These are competitive arenas. Uh, they may be a little wacky in the <laughs> performance arenas, but that doesn't mean they don't have high conscientiousness. Uh, you know, an actress has to show up at 4 a.m. every day and you know, get her makeup done. This is no joke. And so the, the, so it's not surprising that people that get into these, you know, in any of these arenas uh, will have the high conscientiousness that uh, plus the added scrutiny will lead to essentially an overestimation of the worst case scenario. So now every little flaw is, is magnified. Uh, and I think that this contributes a lot to this. So it's not just those groups. I mean, it's anybody. So it could be uh, any, any, uh, uh, gal uh, uh, essentially any age, probably starting at 12, uh, when, when we start to notice that our shapes as, our, as a female is different than the shape of a male and that it matters and that people are paying attention. Uh, if you happen to be a hyper-conscientious individual, it wouldn't be surprising uh, for, for you to not only notice these issues, but also become hypersensitive. And so this is... Um, you know, this is a big root of, of eating disorders, isn't the dysmorphia, but rather the anxiety that one is not doing things perfect and, and, and that one is not perfect. So this is, you know, this is a hard, hard road to hoe uh, because of uh, what, what is in some arenas a phenomenal strength, which is super high conscientiousness. Uh, but in, in other areas, it can be your Achilles heel. And so that's, that's why this is. That's really interesting how you framed it in, in terms of conscientiousness. I never thought about it that way. Do you think that the fashion industry and the motion picture industry and television industry perpetuates eating disorders in some way in women? Because these body sizes don't seem to be attainable for most people. And even some of our wonderful plant-based doctors, and I'm not going to mention their names, but two of them have height weight charts that most women that I know cannot meet. And they come to the ultimate weight loss program looking really good, really fit, really thin, but they're 10 pounds heavier than Dr. X's weight chart. And they are hyper conscientious and they beat themselves up and then they restrict and then they binge. So could you talk a little bit about how maybe those height weight charts are not going to help them uh, in their journey? Beautiful question. Beautiful question. I don't know that I've ever spoken uh, on this issue directly. Uh, so let's let's back up and let's try to understand something. The um, your your body is designed by nature to get to essentially an ideal weight. What we're going to call an ideal weight range. So there's a, there's a range of weights where you, uh, and if we're going to talk about women now, we could talk about men or women. We're going to talk about just about women now because there's some um, specifics. There's some things specific to women. There are, uh, there's a range of weights where, where you were, would be fertile if you're in your fertile years. So let's suppose you're 30 um, and let's suppose you're five foot six. Uh, if you're five foot six and you're 110 pounds, there's a very good chance that you're not fertile. The, uh, you might be, but you might not be. You're starting to really push the envelope. And what's happening is, is that the genes are detecting that your fat stores are so low 
that it must be the case that calories are very hard to come by in this environment. And therefore, it's unlikely that if you get compromised by pregnancy that you could ever have enough calories to support the pregnancy. So the, the genes basically say, not a good time. We're just going to wait, okay? And so the genes would just shut down your menstrual cycle and wait until the uh, body composition has changed to where, where, where the weight ranges are, are uh, more appropriate for being able to carry a child to term. The, um, it's also the case that even if you're a bit heavier, um, God, I even hate to use those words because I know how sensitive people are, but let's suppose your weight is a bit more normal. Um, now, now I'll take another stab at it. Let's say you're five, six, and 117 pounds. Um, it also that's might- a, That's exactly what I weigh, and that's my height. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But let's say, for example, uh, that, that one of the things that you're doing is you are running five miles a day. Now, at this point, um, what can happen is even though your body composition may be uh, normal enough <clears throat> in order to uh, maintain a pregnancy and therefore menses would be on, it may be off. And the reason is, is that the, the, all of the stress that you're putting on the system by exercising that vigorously can signal to the genes that, wow, we may have enough calories for you to be doing okay, but you are working way too hard for those calories. We can tell how hard you're working for these calories. And therefore this is also not going to be viable. All right. So, so I've seen people five, six, five, seven, and 125 pounds, no menstrual cycle. That's because they're ferocious exercisers. Okay. So, in other words, the genes are trying to read the tea leaves here, and they're trying to figure out whether or not you're in an environment that is going to be supportive of being able to be pregnant and, uh, and to bring a child to term. So, the, um, so as a result, we, we actually have a, uh, a device that we could see that's going on, which is the menstrual cycle, which will tell you when things are a little too rough, um, and particularly that you're too thin. So that's, uh, so that's one end of the continuum. The other end of the continuum would be as you, uh, if you were to eat a diet that was comprised of whole natural foods of any reasonable calorie density at all, what's going to happen is that there's going to be essentially a three-part play. What is your exercise level? What is your um, calorie density level, eating to satiety? And um, <clears throat> what are your genes? And I would also say, you could say in principle, a fourth factor, what is your age? So the truth is, is that the, the genes uh, at, 20, at 18 years old haven't fully formed you yet. In other words, you're, you're still an embryo that's still growing, and you're going to be somewhat different at 30 than you are at 18. So, um, so as a result, you can't necessarily tell the story uh, about what a person you know, you won't, won't necessarily wind up at your high school weight um, 20 years later. That isn't necessarily how it'll work because you may have still been going through some developmental processes. Uh, you'll see this, you'll see this very often in men that they may be slender at 22, but at 32, they're a lot stronger. They, they might've put on 15 pounds of muscle. They're a different animal uh, than they were earlier. And women can be the same way. So, um, at any rate, so this is sort of a wide, wide ranging discussion as I'm trying to get at some important points. And that is, is that there is, there is no right weight for you. There's a right weight under conditions of how much, uh, of what the caloric density is that you're eating and how, and your age and your exercise level. So let's suppose that someone is five foot six and let's suppose that there's a range where they would be optimally healthy from 115 to maybe 140 pounds. Okay, you might say, wow, that's a big range. Yeah, it is a big range. Just there's, there's a fairly big range as to how much sunshine you could handle and how tan you would get. Uh, that's also the case. Okay, so uh, also, you know, how much musculature is going to be on the system uh, without essentially stressing the system so much behind so much muscular action that you actually start wearing out joints. Yeah, there's, there's a range of, there isn't one little place in the, in the world where you're at your perfect spot. Okay, there's a, there's a whole range of places. Now, now we're going to look at that because that's an interesting idea. So let's, 
let's quit freaking people out and let's let's narrow this down a little bit. Let's suppose that you're five six and with the given genetics that you um, that the the weight range looks like for you uh, on a very lean diet, pretty high exercise level, but you have your period, you're 125 pounds. Okay. Then we back off the exercise to some degree. We enrich the diet to some degree also, uh, but not using any artificial food. And now you're 138. Okay? It's like, okay, well now we're looking at a 13. We could all agree that that's a 13 pound weight range. You can't find a single biochemical parameter in that person's blood at 138 that isn't just as good as it is at 125. Okay, so there's, there's an absolutely no objective evidence to say that that 138 pounds is in any way inferior to the 125 pounds when it comes to health. Now, here's the problem. Now we're going to um, do two things. Well, what we can do is we can put that person's body on a shadow screen and take photography of it from every angle. As long as we're being obsessive in that cases, we might as well be this obsessive, okay? Now we put that, that person's shadow uh, pictures up on the internet and we let, I don't know, 100,000 men rate these things from every angle. And we put, we not only do that, we put the ranges up. We put her up at 125, at 126, at 127, at 128, at 129, all put 14 different versions up there from 125 to 138. Okay, now we're gonna find out that there's a bell curve of which one the males of the world feels most attractive. And not only that, it gets complicated. Are, are we in Morocco? If it turns out that they're, they're, those men are gonna be have slightly different versions of what it is that they think. What about if we go to China? What if we go to, to the, the uh, Central America? It's all gonna be different. So well, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna just go to Peoria, Illinois which is exactly where they took the Broadway plays to find out what plays in Peoria. So we're going to take, you know, 25,000 men from Peoria of all ages. Oh no, no, we're not. We're just going to take the ages of that specific woman who, which ages she'd be interested in. Okay. So let's just take those. And, uh, and with sociocultural background of those individuals, we're going to weed those out. So we get just the guys that she wants. And then we're going to put those 14 different versions up there. And what we're going to get, folks, is a bell curve. And we have no idea where that bell curve is going to peak. In other words, we don't know which version is the, is the most attractive. Is it 125 pounds? Is that is it actually a curve that starts very high and then slopes down only half of a bell curve? And that 138 is the least attractive? Is it turns out that it's in the middle, that it's at 131, and then it shapes beautifully on either side? Is it up at 135 and it shapes the other way? So it goes low early and then goes higher as we go, I don't know. Nobody knows, okay? And I, I can guarantee you who doesn't know is the fashion industry and television, they don't know. Okay, so, the, um, so here's what's in, because they're actually presenting people for all audiences, for men and women alike and children and everything else under the sun, all right? So, the, uh, you've got camera distortions and all kinds of things going on. So what do actual people really find most attractive? The first question is, what people? Okay. And second of all, then, if, then you, you would have to look at this whole range. So now you start realizing, well, now, wait a second. The, uh, are, are you telling me there isn't a most uh, aesthetically appealing? And the answer is, yeah, it's subjective in the sense that there's a, there's a bell curve where you would be the most popular. That's true, okay? But you have to understand that two or four pounds different, it would be almost exactly the same, okay? And that two or three pounds different from that would be very close. So now you start looking at that there's tremendous subjectivity that's gonna go on within your healthy range. It gets worse than that because it turns out that there's a lot of people that would prefer you outside of the healthy ranges. So there's people that are actually, would actually prefer you thinner than the healthy range. And there's people that would prefer you at fewer heavier than the healthy range. It's like, oh, for crying out loud. Well, who the hell are you going to please? Right? So let's back up and say, okay, we cannot have all the candy in the store. Okay? So I, I've always heard these terms like, 
oh, Walt Frazier was such a cool dude, you know, basketball player, the New York Knicks. He could have any woman he wanted. No, he couldn't. Walt Frazier is very cool. He was very smooth. He had a great game. He had incredibly stylish clothes. The guy was a freaking rock star, okay? But could he have any woman? No, he couldn't, okay? How about some PhD in neuroscience from Columbia University? Would she want to hang out with him? I don't think so, okay? So the point is, is that nobody, and I mean nobody, not Miss America, not Raquel Welch, not, you know, Lady Gaga, nobody has all the candy in the store. And so what we have to do is you got to get realistic about the notion of, look, your job is to be healthy. And your job is to be healthy eating a diet that you're comfortable with that satiates you, that you feel good and you are healthy, okay? Exercise at a reasonable level so that you feel good and you feel healthy. And then you let the chips fall where they may. That's how I look at this problem. And the truth is, is if it turns out that you are, uh, that where you land, let's suppose that you're this gal and you land at 136, okay? And then, and you're like, gee, but the truth is, is that the computer tells me that I would have a little bit higher market share at 128. It's like, okay, well, you know, if you want to suffer, so that, so that a few percentage more of people, like, so 36% of people find you super appealing at 128, but 31% of people would find you super appealing at 136. And you want to move that line over to pick up a few percentage points? Have at it. I think it's crazy, okay, in my judgment. So I think it's a misunderstanding of the math of this problem. The truth of the matter is, is that somebody prefers you at 138, somebody else prefers you at 137, somebody else prefers you at 136, at 35, at 34, all the way down to 125. Those are different people, different eyeballs, different genetics, different preferences. You know, this is, uh, the, 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 this is what I call the subjective with, uh, within the object, or the subjectivity within the objectivity. You can bake me a beautiful burrito, Fantastic, whole natural foods, zuki beans, everything just fantastic the way I like it. You put cilantro in it and I'm done. I'm sending it back. I don't care if 19 people in a row say, oh my God, that's the best burrito I ever had. It's like, not me. I'm not eating a bite of it. As soon as I smell the cilantro, I'm out. There is great subjectivity in these arenas, okay? And so you, you don't have an ideal weight and nobody does you. And so wow. as a result, it's, it's insane to chase it. You let your body simply find where you are healthy and fit and that you feel good eating the food that you like to eat. And, you know, you, you try to make peace with the notion that there is subjectivity within the objectivity. Wow, that this is one of the most profound and beautiful things I've ever heard. And I think it's going to help a lot of women, Dr. Lyle, because I think that they believe that they are more attractive at a lower weight. They, they think that, at least right. how they feel about themselves. And I also think a lot of them think because these two prominent doctors have these charts, that therefore it must be for health reasons and that they must get down to these weights that may not be attainable for them without a great deal of suffering and deprivation. So, so this is incredible. You know, it's interesting because we have a theater here where we have um, something called throwback Thursdays, where they show movies from the forties, fifties, and sixties. And I recently saw guys and dolls and breakfast and Tiffany's at breakfast at Tiffany's. And I was astounded by the fact that even the extras in the background Back then, people were just leaner. And I'm wondering, does attractiveness change as people change? Because really, uh, lean people are the minority right now. And so do we develop taste preferences for what's around us? So like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, if, 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 if everybody's overweight, do we start thinking that that's more attractive? Whereas in the old days, there really weren't that many overweight people, and that's all there was. Um, we know that we know that there, the taste, uh, tastes do change, and there is a, um, and there, and it's undoubtedly moving along the dimension just that I'm talking about. So it's moving along that dimension from 125 to 138. 
you know what, let's just even it out and call it 40. Because there are, there are women that are extremely attractive at five, six, and 140 pounds. There's women that are extremely yep. attractive at five, six, and 150 pounds. Okay, so these are, so, but, but for an individual, that, that individual probably would not have that much range. Because anybody that's extremely attractive at five, six, 150 is a very strong human. Uh, just by nature, uh, the, so probably her range would be 135 to 150. Uh, but the point, or was I wander off into the weeds in no time age? <laughs> what happened? Yeah. The, so uh, it was just, 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 oh, just, just what we preferred. Yeah. Right. So culture is is for our for our five six 125 to 140 person. The culture will move along. It'll move back and forth along continuum. Okay. So. That we can tell that's been happening. Um, the research that's been done in, in social psychology has actually observed this over the last 30 years. So right now we are, you know, we're the, the preferences is for the thinner side of, of the female body type. Uh, that wasn't true in 1965. So in 1965, uh, you know, uh, the, the public might have been thinner just because they weren't eating as much rich food, but the preferences were for for women that were slightly uh, curvier, so the the uh, the cameras will put on you know ten percent or, or so, and so uh, uh, Raquel Welch, she was about five six and one twenty, uh, was a was an iconic ideal. Was really looking in photography like she was one hundred and thirty two pounds. Okay, so five six or so. So that's the um, so that was that that was a curvier body type than the one that, that you're going to see you know, in magazines today, it's going to be a little bit thinner. So, you know, not, not trivial or thinner, you know, maybe seven, eight percent. So that, that, this is sort of that range of 125 to 140, 125 to 140. Now we're on the thinner side of it. I, I have no doubt that the pendulum will move around. Nobody has any idea what drives these things. It's not, <clears throat> the fashion industry isn't driving anything. They're following sort of natural human changes and preferences. They, they sort of follow what their sales look like and eyeballs. So they're, you know, in your, and again, what I would also say is that, that, um, that it's a, this is a huge subjective scramble. So um, I, I can remember I, I had a, a, a kind of a funny incident that really brought this home. A friend of mine uh, was uh, from Hollywood, no less. <laughs> the uh, uh, that w was in Dr. Goldhammer's office, and uh, he there was a there was a a magazine called Shape, and I had seen that magazine. I had been working in the office, and it was there was an attractive blonde lady on the cover, and I remember looking at that, thinking, why would they have that woman on the cover? because she's too thin. It just, I just thought, God, that's weird. Like that is on the cover. And, uh, and he came out, you know, we had lunch later on that day. This, this particular friend of mine, he had been in to get his back worked on and he says, oh my gosh, it was hard to concentrate on what Alan was saying because I kept looking over at that cover of this magazine that he had in his office. And I said, the shape magazine with the blonde? He says, yeah, I said, that's unbelievable. You had two completely different responses. Okay, so in other words, that was a great example of the huge subjectivity and in, in, in preferences. It's, ju it's just like taste of food. Okay, so uh, knocking yourself out to try to quote, hit some ideal, there is no such thing as an ideal. Anybody that is observing you that you're trying to impress, okay, or that you're some audience you're trying to impress, they, every single person in that audience, man, woman, and child, you know, has a different view of what they would think would be ideal. So the kids don't really care. They just, they just like smiling pretty faces, okay? But the, uh, but the adults, the, you know, and if, if you're, you know, what, whoever it is that you would like to think that you're attractive, the truth of the matter is there's no way that we should be working to try to morph our way for a specific, for a specific thing. Um, not, not in suffer doing it, 
your job is to get healthy. Get healthy and get fit and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, I, I, I hope all the women watching this will, will take your advice because I see them suffering so much around this yeah. issue. And the truth is, is it really doesn't matter because you're not going to please everybody. Like you say, when I was heavy, people told me I was too fat. And now I'm told you're too thin, you don't look good. So, I mean, who, who am I trying to look good for? Like you say, be healthy. And that's, and that's be I, I, I and hope they'll- you want yeah, to and, feel good physically. That's what we want to and do. Throw, and throw the scale away. You did a whole lecture once about the people that were scale monkeys. So th this, yes. this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. So on to the topic of sleep, which you've been very interested in lately and done a few talks about at the Fasting Escape, that wonderful water-only fasting center now in your Belinda, California, that is amazing, run by Dr. Nate Gershfeld. And you speak there from time to time. And you've been talking about sleep and the importance of it uh, for preventing Alzheimer's and all kinds of things. And so Leah said that she heard the talk and she says she routinely sleeps nine hours, but doesn't reach satiety. Mm -hmm. Should she continue and sleep another hour to 10 hours? Or is there a point when that's too much sleep? No, there's never too much sleep. Okay. So she should absolutely be sleeping to satiety. And it doesn't matter if it's 12 hours. Okay. So... Your, uh, what we want to be doing is sleeping to satiety as many nights of this life and, and to be sleep satiated as many days and nights as you can. Um, you know, the modern world is going to attack that uh, with all kinds of inducements and, and stimulation, but absolutely, without a doubt, there is no such thing as sleeping too much. Uh, when you're sleeping, people will say, oh, it'll make you depressed. No, you're probably depressed and that's why you're sleeping. Your brain is is cycling over a lot of struggles and issues and frustrations. And uh, because it's working overtime and it's exhausted, uh, uh, then it needs time to recharge. So the, no, to the best of my knowledge, there is no evidence to suggest that you can oversleep a brain. And so, yeah, you, and, and if you sleep less than you want, you are essentially short. So yeah, sleep as much as you want and as much as you can. And it's a debt you can't pay back once you've sleep yes. debt you can't pay it back. So it's it's not like money where you know right. it's, it's gone, it's gone. So yes. yeah, it's really thank you so much for educating us on the importance of sleep. I've always valued my sleep and I, I actually enjoy it. And I'm I don't care if I'm not the life of the party. Ten o'clock, I'm going to bed. You can stay out and do what you want, but that's my bedtime. So Another question on sleep, you discussed before how difficult it is for people that are shift workers that work the night shift, like nurses and stuff, but Millie had a question because she has a little bit of an unusual situation. She's sort of like an air traffic controller. So she has a really stressful job, but they change her schedule every two weeks. So one week she starts at 5.30 a.m. The next week she goes from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then the third week it's 9 to 6. And so she gets good sleep. She had a sleep test, but only sleeps four to six hours. So how does somebody with such an erratic schedule practice good sleep hygiene? Oh boy, these, these are just overwhelming questions because the truth is, is that this is a, this is a brutal way to live. The, uh, this is not how human beings were designed to live. So this, this person is being just kind of constantly thrown into essentially a crisis uh, situation where she's having to go against her instincts. Um, all I can tell her is that, that, um, you know, work needs to be done in that house to make sure that you have an extremely dark room, that you've got whatever Bose headphones on or whatever to make it quiet so that you can possibly uh, get as sleep satiated as you can, as you can get. The, um, yeah, if she's sleeping four to six hours, you know, uh, whatever somebody says that they tested her and her sleep is fine, that just means her sleep's functioning fine. It doesn't mean she's getting enough. So uh, it probably what is happening is the disruption uh, that is caused by this completely wacky schedule is, you know, it's, it's going to be taking its toll. And so right. but this is no way for human beings to be treated. Uh, I understand that, that the world has 24 hour needs these days, which is again, totally unnatural. Um, you know, human beings didn't work through the night anywhere ever. This is not something, but now we're flying all over the globe. We've got a 24 hour human life now suddenly that didn't exist a hundred years ago. Okay. So this is uh, this is a totally brand new uh, phenomenon. And so you have people now that have jobs 
you know, it would be better if they had people that were just routinely in exactly the same schedule every day and they just morph their life around being the person that works, you know, works the night shift. The, uh, it's not easy for people to do that and it's hard on, but it's better than having this crazy thing where they rotate it you know, consistently and have people uh, all discombobulated. So now yeah, all I can tell her is get on some good night shades, get a dark room, get yourself some earplugs in and try to sleep as much as you can. That's, that's the best thing that I can do. Yeah. When, when she came to me, I said, find another job because it's impacting her ability to eat right and exercise because she's tired all the time. Oh yeah. This is all, I understand it's a very good job. It's a highly responsible job and I probably pays quite well. I mean, this is highly skilled stuff, but at the same time, it's crazy. So yeah, you want to try to find some job in an air traffic controller somewhere where they're not going to set that kind of schedule. I mean, right. that's Thank you. not an easy, you know, I know that's easy for me to say and it's maybe impossible to do, but, but that's, you, you've got to fight the consequences of that schedule. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oh, so many good questions here. I don't know which one to go to next, but um, I'll go to this one from Lisa. She says, why is it when I finally reach my weight goal, I think I can relax and have a treat, like a glass of wine or a rich dessert, vegan, of course, which invariably causes me to relapse and regain my weight. Why is weight maintenance so much more difficult than weight loss? Yeah, uh, maybe because when you are losing weight, you're feeling the excitement of your moving towards the, and the achievement. And, <clears throat> and there's the promise of all the benefit that you're going to get when you get there. So you're in the middle of a process. And so therefore you, you have that kind of, you know, you're getting incremental feedback of improvement. Uh, when, you, when you stop that process, suddenly there's no incremental progress. Uh, and so as a result, the, now you're just sort of defending the achievement and it's, um, it's less exciting. There's essentially a less, less payoff for doing what it is that you're doing. The, uh, so there's a lot less psychological payoff. So I, I can understand exactly how this would happen. Uh, this, is, <clears throat> uh, this is why it's difficult after a championship team wins. It's not easy for them to come back and repeat. And that's because they're not as hungry. Okay, they're the, the, they got to the achievement and now, now what, what more do they have to prove? Okay, that's why Michael Jordan quit basketball after winning three titles in a row. He went and played baseball and tried to do something new and different, try to uh, actually keep his interest. So this is, this is human nature. So you reach the achievement and you're like, well, now there's no big gain from doing it right. So this is, what, this is where we have to get focused on, on paying attention to the very important, subtle internal signals that I call self-esteem. Okay, this is, this is really the heart and soul of very important life management is paying attention to the fact that you've got an internal audience that's watching your behavior and it's giving you signals, uh, feedback, as if other people were watching. This is um, <clears throat> very much akin to Freud's superego. Uh, the, the difference being that Freud's thinking is, is that your little superego is fixed by early childhood, by parental expectations, et cetera, and none of that's true. Okay, so uh, what this is, is a much more flexible dynamic apparatus that your self-esteem can be very high for three days in a row as you do an excellent job. And then it can just turn tail the next, you know, on the fourth day when you go and blow it. And uh, it's not going to scream at you. It's going to be quiet. It's a very, it's, it's a relatively intermediate level whisper. Um, it basically will just have a little internal disgust uh, for what it is that you did. The truth of the matter is, is that the loud noises and feeling uh, of esteem come from reactions from other people. So that's why it is that people try to lose a lot of weight. They want to actually get reactions from other people. Uh, they want to earn esteem from other people. With their focus on. And that's what, the big, that's what the big impact is on the nervous system. So as a person is losing weight and getting in better and better condition, the, uh, what's happening is, is that they're getting that kind of feedback. And so that's a very exciting process uh, for that to happen. AJ, managing your, managing your zoo. I got it. The, I'm uh, sorry. That's so I, I even that. 
I even insane. put a sign on the door. I, I know, you know what it is, Dr. Lyle, if they're delivering the cover for this new microphone and I put a sign on the door and I said, please do not knock the baby sleeping. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they won't oh, what there. are you going to do? Cutest thing I've ever seen. You are bad dog. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. What was I, what was I even talking um, about? about? Well, the, about maintenance is harder yes. because the internal audience is, uh, it's right. harder the because audience is just by nature quieter. And so the, uh, and so when the, when the general audience, you've got achieved this weight loss and you're getting good positive feedback from people, you know, intuitively that if you go eat some junk, it's not going to change your weight very much. You know, it's not. So now you start running a cost benefit on the whole thing. And you're just like, well, you know, why not? Like, what am I, some saint? And, uh, and why am I really doing this? Why not do this? And the issue here is that, that you, what you won't hardly notice is that when you do that, your internal audience is watching. And, but if you pay attention, you'll find that there's a little bit of self-disgust. Now that little, self, little bit of self-disgust, there's a reason why it's only a little bit of self-disgust. It's because it's not poison. It hasn't destroyed you. It hasn't completely wrecked your goals or it hasn't wrecked your life but it's there, okay? So we wanna pay attention to it. We wanna get uh, more aware of the internal audience and its reactions. The reason why is that there's a, a different kind of a feeling that comes with, you know, even once you've reached that weight goal, there's a feeling that comes with continuing to earn the esteem of the internal audience. And so you're, this isn't, you're not gonna necessarily earn it every day and you're not gonna do things perfectly. But the truth of the matter is, is that if you do a really good job, you get to experience that feeling. The, um, Alan had a story. This was an incredible story. His, uh, his wife's father uh, was some guy from the old country in Italy. <laughs> and uh, so this was his father-in-law. And his father-in-law as a young man had worked in some kind of a factory somewhere in the middle of, I don't know, New Jersey. And he was a very hard worker, very high conscientiousness. And then what happened is early in his career, it, the, the place got unionized. And when it got unionized, he's continued to work hard, but he started to get social pressure from the other people that were working with him because he was making them look bad. And so they, they basically, you know, they socially pressured him into mediocrity. And <clears throat> so for the next 40 years, this guy worked at the same factory in mediocrity and he hated his job. And then right before he was to retire, for some reason, he decided to start to work hard again. It's like, well, he's leaving anyway. So, you know, he's, you know, they can't kick him out now because he's leaving. So this very same natural conscientiousness now with nothing to lose by doing it gets executed. And he starts doing an excellent job as his work again. And he loves it. How about that? And then he retires. He's like, why did I do that? Why did I spend 40 years miserable? I should have just found a way to beat back this pressure that was causing me to be mediocre. <clears throat> but he just didn't do it. He spent his life miserable with his work. What an incredible story about you know, how to do things. So his internal audience was miserable with him because he knew you know, what it felt like to do well, and he didn't do it. Okay, so this is exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about, that the pleasure trap can pull you in to mediocrity. And there's a feeling that comes with doing an excellent job and, and the internal audience watching it. That's that feeling that he had when he was doing a good job. Okay, so the, the reason why it's hard to hold on to this is there's pressure that's that's essentially drawing you in and saying, come on, 
go ahead and step out of line and be mediocre. And the world isn't going to care. They're not, they can't tell the difference in your weight if you've eaten a chocolate sundae or not. They have no way of telling us. They'll only tell if it goes on for a long time. Okay. So, but then we stoke the pleasure trap. We've also now uh, undermined our self esteem. And now we have a nice little storm of trouble that then, you know, essentially the wheels come off. The way to stop this is to get more acutely aware of the feeling of self esteem and to understand the value of what it feels like to essentially be doing things right. Okay. That's, that's the defense against this problem. And that's what I, that's what the slow fast way is all about. That's a webinar that I did with Gustavo and I think January of 2016, that's the, that's the focus of that webinar is that what we're trying to do is to do a good job for the internal audience and let the chips fall where they may for the external audience, which incidentally is exactly the same message that we had earlier in this, in this uh, webinar with respect to where it is that your weight lands. Do an excellent job for your, for your health and yourself and let the chips fall where they may. Wow. That's incredible. This is not the first time you've said this, but it's so profound, especially for people hearing it for the first time. Because for me, when you reframe it like that, that the pleasure trap will pull us into mediocrity, I don't want to be mediocre. And I don't want my internal audience disgusted with me. So if somebody offers me a rich treat that might be delicious, I, I, I look at it this way and I was like, well, I don't want to undermine my self-esteem. I don't want to feel disgusted with myself. And this is, I, I think it's brilliant. It's, it's so brilliant. It just seems that so many people, once they lose weight, it's almost like they forget calorie density. And they, even if they're not lured into the pleasure trap, they seem to forget that they need to not only continue what they did to lose weight, but maybe even tighten the screws. Whereas so many people, once they lose weight, they're like, ah, I deserve a treat. And they loosen the screws. And that's why probably less than 2% of the people actually maintain their weight loss. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think more of our people probably do just because we have a better program. Most people are losing weight through severe restriction. But, right. But that's the, true. Hmm. But, the, but these same kind of problems remain. So we first yeah. had your dog, and now I got my cat scratching. Yeah, that's okay. That's great. This is, this is, this, this is real life. You know, on a previous broadcast, uh, somebody, a, a gentleman had asked you about a coworker that had lost a lot of weight and started to gain the weight back. His clothes were tight, and he, and he asked you if, if he should say something, and you should say, he knows, don't say anything. Right. So um, Judy wanted to know if it's ever appropriate to say something if it's somebody you really love and care about, because we've had so many people now in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, three to be exact, that have regained a hundred pounds or more. Right. We're not talking about you know five pounds, and and she feels like she wishes if there was something appropriate to say, just like hey, I'm like, is there something we can say to them before they gain the hundred, or is it just shut up, mind your own business, even if they're your friend? Yeah, mind your own business. The truth is wow. that they are well aware of the problem. Okay, they are vastly more aware of the problem mm -hmm. than you are aware of the problem, and they are they are paying tremendous psychological prices for it. You saying it, okay, it is 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 in no way useful. So just you know, mind your own business. You need to signal to those people if they're your friends. You signal to them. Uh, how and why you value them for who it is that they are. Okay. You look right past their, their struggle and you let them find their way. Wow. And don't even say, is there anything I can do to help you? Just don't completely, bother. Ig completely no. ignore the elephant in the room. I mean, that's a bad totally choice of words. Wow. That's, it's yeah. just so hard when, when you care about them, you know? Yeah. For, but they know. So there's nothing we can do to help no, somebody if it's relapsing. This is their own personal odyssey. Wow. They're going to wow. have to find their way. They're, they're, they know, they've got the information. They know what to do. Right. This, oh. is, uh, this, is a, this is a quiet personal journey that, that everyone has to you know, essentially make, make a series of decisions that you know, uh, go in a direction that's going directly counter to instinct. This is everybody walks this road their own way. And by, by pointing out that somebody is failing in some fashion is in no way going to be helpful.
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Meredith wanted to know if it would make sense to make our food really boring and repetitive, or will that get us itching for new flavors? You know, there's individual differences here. <clears throat> so th this is why it is that you, you have to find your own. Uh, this is actually discovering yourself. Uh, it turns out that, that for me, there has to be a moderate level of, of, of variety. For Alan, it's less. Uh, he needs less variety than I do. Uh, but not not too dissimilar. But I'm a little more a little more adventurous than he is, just generally. Uh, not a lot, but but one chunk more open to experience. There's people that are very open to experience that need a lot of novelty and variety, uh, uh, or else they're going to get bored. Those people are going to have a harder time. It's essentially uh, <clears throat> it's essentially the the uh, it's kind of it's kind of like if you if you can go every week weekend to go bowling, it's like not a problem. You just go bowling. But if you're but if you're going to watch TV, it has to be something new every week. And somebody's going to have to produce a new show because we can't watch the same shows that we had last week. So this is the the, the novelty seeking chip, you know. Uh, in people can the circumstances can be so different uh, dependent upon essentially their personalities. And so this is a problem. If you're, uh, so if you're someone who really wants to experience the world and you get bored very quickly, which is just absolutely some people's nature, then you're going to have to invest more time and energy in the production and access to novelty when it comes to food. You're just going to have to do it. The, uh, I can eat you know, one basically russet potatoes. If I never had anything but russet potatoes, and, and uh, yams, that's all the, the tubers that I would ever really need to eat. Okay, there's little potatoes, purple potatoes, yellow potatoes, you find gold <laughs> potatoes, like, yeah, I understand. But the truth is, is all I need is a good organic russet and, and a yam, that's it. That's an individual difference. That, that has made this road simpler for me. And so, and it's gonna turn out that the people in general that are the most successful are the people that are that can have the narrowest, simplest, most repetitive food choices. But if that isn't your personality, then don't try to make it your personality because it's not your personality. So instead, that this is when you have to uh, go to extra effort to widen the novelty factor. Uh, that's that's how I would look at it. You have to match your environment with your personality uh, when it comes to this. Wow, that's profound. Match your environment to your personality. That's that's brilliant. I think I'm I'm sort of somewhere between you and Alan because I kind of eat the same thing every day and I don't get bored. But what I do is I switch up maybe the spice, maybe the different different flavor vinegar one day, and that way I, I'm having kind of what you might say is variety within the restriction. But right. with TV, I watch I I watch the same episode of Lucy every single day. So. I'm good with that. That's great, Dr. Lyle. Thank you. So Janice says that she notices that her anxiety causes her to eat too much of the starchy foods. Any tips from Dr. Lyle to deal with anxiety without comfort foods? Yeah, that's what she thinks she notices, but she doesn't have any idea. Okay, so let's talk about uh, people will think that they, quote, eat too much uh, of you know, whatever healthy foods. Let's, let's see if they really know if that's true. That, that comes from the, the observation that sometimes you eat more than you eat at other times. Okay, so are we eating the right amount at the other times or are we eating the right amount at this time? Have we actually overeaten or, or were we under eating at the other times? Well, how do you know? Okay, so this is all like speculative. So whenever anybody tells me, oh, I overeat, it's like, well, how would you know? Overeat for what? Because right away, we've got a, we actually have a, 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 an incorrect inference on the notion that there's a right amount to eat because there's no such thing. So when I give the lecture on the perfect personality, I actually have an example that I use that is theoretically uh, uh, an incorrect example, but I'm doing it for a reason to try to explain a point. And that is that I say, okay, suppose these two guys 
uh, need 500 calories for the next while. And so if they both eat these 500 calories of whole natural foods, they'll both reach satiety at the appropriate time. Okay. So, but now what I want to do is I want to walk that back and I want to explain something. There is not a right amount of food for you to eat today at lunch. That is an impossible question to answer. What's the right amount of food for me to eat to lunch? That there is no answer to that question. And let me explain why. What is the food for? Are you attempting to um, eat, you know, not eat until five o'clock? Or are you gonna eat at 4.45? Or are you gonna eat at 4.30? Or are you gonna eat a snack at two o'clock? Or are you not gonna eat till 6.30? Okay, so what, what is the purpose of that food? That's like saying, what's the right amount of gas to put in the car? Well, what do you mean the right amount of gas to put in the car? It depends upon when we plan to stop next and fill it up or put more gas in the car. Uh, so the, the point is, is that as long as there's gas in the car, it's fine. If you're going to start to get into danger of running out of gas, then that's a problem. Then the little light goes on. Then you put some gas in. Oh, did you put in the right amount? What do you mean the right amount? I put in two gallons. That's all the money I had. Okay. <laughs> no problem. We go, we drive for now. We drive for a while. So what if I filled it? Well, that's all the gas you could put in the car. Oh, I think I put in too much. Well, what do you mean too much? Did you spill it on the ground? So if you filled your stuff yourself full, did you eat too much? No. All that means is that you're not going to have to, to be buying gas soon. That's all. So the, the, the question itself, you know, essentially exposes a, a mistake in thinking. So she's thinking that anxiety causes her to eat more starches and that she's eating too much when she does that. No, no. Uh, if the anxiety drives you to eat more starches, fine. What do we care? All that means is that means you're, it's going to be longer between now and you. Let's suppose that every 10 o'clock she has to face some phone call from some draconian idiot, okay, and her job. So she gets anxious. And let's suppose that that anxiety causes her to wolf down two big old baked potatoes, okay, before. So that's just what happens, okay? So it does. And so, so that now she has the horrendous phone call with this boss that, you know, works out of Peoria. See, you got Peoria in <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the point is, is that, so we have this thing that happens. And so now the question is, uh-oh, did she eat too much at 10 in the morning, those two potatoes? Eat too much for what? It means whenever that phone call comes in, guess what? She's not as hungry at lunch as she is normally, right? So did you eat too much then or not eating enough at lunch or what? So this is, uh, my answer to the question is no. Your anxiety is not causing you to eat too much. If that were true, then what would happen is, is that anxious individuals would be more overweight than non-anxious individuals, which is not true, okay? So, uh, so relax. If you're anxious and that anxiety causes you to chomp through a bunch of whole natural foods, this is not going to be cause you to be systematically overweight. You are not overeating. It just means that you're eating more right now. And you might, uh, the, the eating of the food is probably causing some endorphins to be released because the, the organism creates a little bit of stress when you're hungry. And it basically says, Hey, we got to worry about starvation. Anybody that's ever fasted for a day knows what this feels like. You start going 10, 12, you know, 10 hours without food, you start to get a little edgy. It's like, hey, this is not comfortable. You start realizing what an incredibly important central issue having food in you is and what an enormously important issue food is in life. Food is a much bigger issue in life than people are aware of in the modern environment. Uh, Stone Age individuals are thinking about food constantly. Food is a tremendously important issue. This is what runs the action in the animal kingdom is food. Like, wow, this is a really big deal. We've actually pushed food into a small corner. Okay, it's, it's so abundant and you can just go down and throw a $5 bill on the counter and get food. But this is not what food is really about in human life. So it's no surprise if you're getting anxious uh, that there would be a soothing process that would go along with eating food. 
yeah, it's going to relax some anxiety down. That's true. Now you say, well, gee, am I eating? I'm eating too much because of that. What do you mean too much? What that all that that's going to happen is that's going to push down the road and delay your hunger. So it's not causing you to eat too much. So if you're if you're having a weight problem, it isn't because anxiety is driving driving you to overeat your food. You may have noticed the connection between anxiety and and chomping down some more starches, but that's not causing you to systematically overeat. If you're systematically overeating, um, it's for some other reason, i.e., somewhere in there we've got food that's too high for density. Wow, thank you so much. No matter how many times you say this, women are still afraid to to not restrict their food, especially starches. And you know, it's funny because so many of them come to us from those weighing and measuring programs where they're yes. taught there is a correct amount of food to eat every single day, regardless of how tall you are or how much you weigh. And there's a specific time you're supposed to eat it. And there's the hardest people I have to work with to, to, yes. to reprogram them. Uh, it's, it's almost the most difficult thing I think we do. Really interesting. I mean, that, that's just such fascinating misconceptions. And the um, whoever is coming up with that idea is way out there. Like this is so inconsistent with biology um, that it, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The uh, and, and this is of course nothing but trouble and mischief for people that are very high conscientiousness. So you know you you give a high conscientious person this little set of procedures that they're supposed to do, and, and you can get them essentially. Um, unconscious of some very strong signals that are coming from other places in their nervous system that are telling them that this is ridiculous. It's, right. And they come to me and they say, well, I don't know when I'm hungry. Well, and I don't know when I'm full because they're, they, they've done this. Where this comes from, Dr. Lyle, is from the, the food addiction people uh, like Overeaters Anonymous and where this is how they treat uh, overweight or obesity with a weighing and measuring food plan. And also right. their food plan doesn't include the kind of foods that we would include. It's including right. oils and animal products right. and salt and yeah. Yeah, this is all, this is all some, some pretty serious misconceptions uh, up, and, up and down the line all the way into academia. Um, an interesting thing that I just, you know, I just heard about, I'm sure you did because you're more connected to the world than I am, that a, uh, a major Cornell researcher, that there was actually a researcher in the behavioral sciences side of the nutrition field. So Colin Campbell had never met this person, but they're at Cornell, they're a big shot professor. And um, it turns out that the guy was just doing horrendous science and publishing like crazy. And uh, some of the science that he published, I have criticized. Uh, I, I never read his work. I didn't even know his name, but I had just heard the results. And the result, uh, one of the things he said was, oh, put the food on a smaller plate, and then it'll look like it's more food. Okay? Oh, Brian Wansink. Yeah. Okay. And I've and I, I heard that 10 years ago, and, I, and I, that, that kind of talk drives me crazy. It's like... The notion, uh, and, and I've heard very intelligent people parrot this because after all, it was published somewhere. So there's, there's truth in it. And I'm like, I know there's no truth in it. I know that's totally bogus. Uh, it, you really want to try this with your dog? So you're going to put the same, or you're put 80% of the food you usually food put for Bailey, put it on a tiny, tiny little plate, have it overflow on the plate, and let's see if Bailey's like, oh my God, that's too much food. <laughs> okay, the, the notion that a nervous system of an animal that has been exquisitely designed over three and a half billion years of evolution to make sure that it gets the right amount of food for survival and optimally puts its, uh, put its uh, chemistry in a situation to optimize its survival for the right amount of fat stores, right amount of strength, right amount of muscle for the, the challenges that it has. You're telling me that you can fool that thing with the size of the plate? That is insane, and I knew it was crazy. Now, I don't have time to chase down every crazy idea and go to my own lab and prove it wrong. That's what they count on. So this guy published trash science for his whole career. He was a big shot professor. He's a fraud, okay? And the thing is, is that a lot of us that, that sit tight to this and watch real live people eat in real life circumstances and watch them get well, we know the truth 
And what we speak of is integrated down all the way through biology. Okay, so this is uh, this notion that you need to weigh and measure your food. Really? If you think that's true, why isn't it happening throughout the animal kingdom for every other species? The answer is it's a ludicrous idea. Do, what about keeping the food within a certain narrow window during the day? No, there's absolutely no evidence that anywhere in the animal kingdom this takes place. So the truth is, is that you eat to satiety on the food in, uh, foods of your natural history at any time of day or night that that food would be reasonably available, okay? You're not, don't wake yourself up in the middle of the night with an alarm clock so that you can go eat some more for God's sake. You know, use some reasonable judgment. But yes, weighing and measuring, food windows, all this kind of stuff, this makes no sense. And guess what? At no surprise that there is no scientific support for it. And anybody that is saying there's scientific support for it is not reporting any science that is legitimate, okay? Wow. So this is, uh, yeah, this program, what is it you're doing? This is, this is you, know, you know, we can have disagreements and there's going to be some smart people that are going to you know, have 3%, 5% little, little, you know, we can, this is this place, the, the question we started with. There's going to be some subtle argumentation as we fiddle around around exactly what's true in Oregon, what's a little three, three degrees off. But that's all. The truth is, is that the program that you're sharing with people is outstanding, and you, you, you want to go just exactly this direction, and this is, this is the way home, and this is the way to get some inner peace where you don't have to be doing some of this crazy stuff that's completely contrary to our nature. Wow, that, that's amazing. And, you know, Dr. Lyle, anytime I've tried to put my food on a smaller plate, I've just had to go back for so many more servings. So <laughs> that's what I like about True North. Dr. Goldhammer has purchased the largest plates available, 11-inch dinner plates. Uh-huh. Yeah. There you go. And yet everyone magically loses weight. Even magically large. loses weight. That's, that's right. amazing. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much. You are just such a delight to talk to and your information is amazing. Whenever I interview you, I have to, I like to listen to it over and over because you speak the truth. So thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. And thanks to all of you for watching another episode of Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ and I make healthy taste delicious.